we were wondering what would we get if we had the results of every single election that we've ever had in India. Right? What would we learn about our democracy in action? Um, firstly, the data is not particularly easy to get. It's available in the form of a bunch of PDFs from the Election Commission. A lot of PDFs, actually. And um, the trouble with this is also that the data is not particularly accurate. If you look at, for example, Madira, that's spelled in multiple ways, or Devar Konda, Devara Konda, Devar Konda, Sulurpet, Sulurpeta, they're all the same places, okay? but they're spelled 53 times in one way, 40 times in another way, and it's ha hard to figure out if, when you say Chennur, it is the same as Chinnur, or it's a completely different district, and it turns out that they are completely different. But after a fair bit of work, we did manage to clean this data and a bunch of other data sets and said, let's see what we find. So one of the questions somebody had was, look, in the context of the Karnataka elections in 2013, who are the richest candidates? It'll be good to publish this in the press. So we <laughs> played around with that data and came up with something that was published in Vijay Karnataka. And each of these boxes is one candidate, so the size of the box represents the wealth of one candidate. The color is based on the party that they stand for. So the blues are Congress, the saffrons are BJP. And you'll notice one huge box out here, right? So that's effectively one candidate whose wealth is more than pretty much all of BJP put together. Okay. <clears throat> So that's uh, Priya Krishna, and he has a wealth of about 767 crores. But that begs the question, how much is 767 crores? They wanted to publish something in the paper that gives you a sense of how large this number is. You know? So they said, you know, will it fill the entire Vidhan Sauda if I took it out, out as cash and placed it in the floor? You know, will it fill a large hall? So we did some quick calculations. So firstly, if you take one lakh, that's something you can hold in your hand. Okay? Uh, 10 lakhs is like a mini or reasonably large book. Um, one crore, now we're talking some serious money, it's about the size of a small suitcase, and 10 crores is either the size of a large suitcase or a cupboard. Okay, so that's how much you can carry. But money gets very heavy, by the way. Don't be misled by the fact that, you know, when I say a suitcase, it's the size of a suitcase, it weighs a whole lot more. You're not going to be able to carry 10 crores that easily. 100 crores, now we're talking some serious money. This fills a king size bed. Okay? And 1,000 crores is about the size of, well, I mean, it wouldn't fill anywhere near this room, but you can sort of stack it in the corner of a room and it can fill a good room. Now, at this point, we realized we have a problem because 767 crores is not even going to, is not going to fill the Vidhan Sauda. It's not even going to fill a small room. So that doesn't quite work. So uh, I'm just for reference, 10,000 crores is this big. Okay? So that's, that's a lot of money. That's the amount of money that there is in the entire election system in Karnataka, uh, in, if you add up the wealth of all of the candidates. So we took a compromise. We said, OK, let's just take the entrance of the Vidhan Sauda and cover the entrance. It's good enough. People will get a sense of how large it is. But of course, um, we had a bigger challenge during the uh, assembly, the, during the parliamentary elections the next year when Nandan Nilekani crowded out the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> so at 7,700 crores, he had more wealth than all of the other parties put together almost. Right? So like a, a huge difference. I mean, if you look, if you start drilling down into the amount of wealth that he has. Um, so there's, I mean, compared to the second highest candidate who would probably be out here, and I'm not quite able to read that, yeah, Kanwar Singh Tanwar of BJP. I mean, this is not even a comparison, right? He could buy the election out completely, yeah. <clears throat> but it's not just the wealth that we were looking at. There's a number of other interesting things that come out of the, uh, <clears throat> the submissions that each of these candidates make. For instance, one of the things that comes out is uh, the number of criminal cases against these candidates. So we said, let's take a look and see how that breaks up by party, right? And what we found was AAP was right there on top, the Ahmadi <laughs> Party. which made no sense whatsoever, and then we dug into the details. So there is this Dr. Uday Kumar with 382 IPC cases against him, and Pushparayan with 380 IPC cases. I mean, if you filed a case every week, the police would be busy for, what, seven and a half years. Just, just filing cases, not even, you know, uh, actually do anything about it. Uh, now, of course, these are activists, and it is their job to protest against various things and go to jail. So the kinds of things that they've been filed, in, the kinds of cases that have been filed against them have been mostly, well, somewhat serious IPC sections, but mostly for social agitation and things like that. So it sort of explains it, but it is a little odd that you know, the party that you would not think has the largest number, you, know, you would not expect the AAP to have the largest number of these, right? Now, we were, as we were playing around with this data, we said, look, let's go a step further 
further. Now, it's fine for us to play around with this data, but can we actually get someone on television to do this? Meaning, the role of an anchor is normally to come out there and read a prepared script. Can we transform an anchor into an analyst who will take a call and, as these calls come through, answer the questions just by playing around with the data live? So, <clears throat> this huge 92-inch uh, touchscreen was installed at CNN and IBN's office. And uh, uh, we started putting some visuals around it so that the anchor could answer questions quickly as they come along. Incidentally, there is a hack here as well. Um, that's me in the red t-shirt at the back making my first television appearance. And first thing that I did as soon as I got behind the screen was called home and said, look, turn on CNN and IB and you'll see me. Yeah. And the kinds of questions that came to them were bizarre. So for instance, somebody asked the question, you know, who's won by the lowest ever margins in history? Turns out that that's, um, uh, there were two candidates, uh, one from BJP and one from Congress, who in 1998 and 1999 won by exactly nine votes. Right? So if, for instance, their family had voted the other way, it would probably have you know, made a difference to the elections. There haven't been many uncontested wins. So one of the questions that came up was, has there ever been one? And this guy was playing, Bupinder Chaube was playing around with the results and found that since 1989, there has never been an election where there has been only one candidate standing for a, a single constituency. But prior to 1989, there have been several such. And in fact, uh, <clears throat> they obviously have won by a fairly large margin, 100%. Um, <clears throat> has there been uh, an election where only women have contested? And it turns out that there were two elections, one in Karur and one in uh, Panskura, uh, West Bengal, but a very long time ago where only women have contested. But on the other hand, there haven't been many elections, only eight of them, where there were more women than men, which is kind of interesting as well. Uh, who's the oldest candidate that ever stood for elections? So the answer turns out to be a 99-year-old gentleman um, who contested from Maharashtra. Now, uh, what you would do if you won the election at the age of 99 is a tough question to answer. But, but among the more interesting questions that got asked was, uh, which is the least successful party? I mean, we know that Congress is remarkably successful, almost 50% of the elections that it's ever contested in its one, but is there something like a least successful party? And after a bit of digging in, we did find one party which had some interesting characteristics. You may have never heard of this party. It's called the Durdarshi Party. So they stood for elections in 1984 for the first time, and out of the um, and 97 seats that they uh, 97 candidates that they fielded across 97 seats, they won exactly zero. So, which is not a great record, but they didn't give up. They tried again, in, uh, and that was in 1989 when they contested in 298 seats. Now, this is a record, okay? There was only one party that was larger than them in terms of presence, and that was the Congress. So this is effectively the second largest party, and they won zero. They tried again, 1991, and this time with an even larger presence, 321 candidates right across the country went down even to the south and won zero again. So 700 odd contests and zero victories, but what's even worse is that not only did they never win, they never were even the runner-up. At best, they were number three, and that was mostly in places where there were only three candidates. So <laughs> what this party is doing, I am, or was doing, I'm not sure, but I. I have a small suspicion that part of its lack of success might be attributable to the fact that their candidates had to be teetotalers, um, <laughs> non-smoking, vegetarian, bachelors, and I think celibate as well, I'm not sure. I don't know if they expected their voters to be the same, but I would not be surprised. Mm. <laughs> uh, yet another question was, is there a winning constituency? You know, there are winning parties, but is there such a thing as a constituency where if I crack this one, I will almost certainly win the elections? Turns out that um, <laughs> before the elections last time, we found that Faridabad is one of those that has this interesting characteristic. So if you look at the parties, if you look at the parties that had won the elections, sorry, where am I here? Uh, there was, it was Congress mostly, and then there was JNP in the middle, and then a stretch of Congress, stretch of BJP, and then Congress back again. And Faridabad had consistently, ever since the constituency had been created, always voted in the party that had the national majority. And it turns out that in the 2014 elections as well, they voted that way, so its record is still unbroken. There is only one constituency that is consistently voted for the winner every time. Uh, <clears throat> now, some of this data can throw weird insights, and one of the weirdest that we saw was, the, uh, uh, was a question around the number of candidates that stand for elections in any constituency. So the question was, what is the largest number of people that ever stood for an election? And we 
fiddled around with the numbers and we found the answer. But I'll show you the answer uh, and you'll find it quite striking. So this is the uh, map of the assembly elections in Tamil Nadu in 1967. Each circle represents one constituency. The size of the circle represents the number of candidates that stood for election. So for example, this is Perambalur, where there were as many as 18 candidates that stood for election, a reasonably large number. Um, <coughs> sorry, 10 candidates that stood for elections. Not, not so large a number. Um, <coughs> but if you fast forward to the next year, you'll find that the numbers haven't changed all that much. There still aren't too many candidates standing for elections. But in 1977, there is a slight spurt. There's a lot more activity and the color changes. The color represents which party won. The yellows are DMK, the reds are ADMK, and now there's a new party which has swept the election. So clearly there's a lot more activity out here. But we're still not looking at a huge number of candidates. 1980, nothing much. 1984, now we have something interesting. So we have Madhurantakam with as many as 90 candidates standing for elections. So at this point, you're not looking at a ballot sheet. You're looking at a ballot booklet, right? You've got a few pages to get there. Um, <clears throat> And the next year, there was higher participation, but nothing quite stands out. But in 1991, now you have two constituencies, um, <coughs> Palipet and Avarakurichi, where there are as many as 250 candidates standing for elections. OK, mini book, half of the telephone directory, perhaps. But all of this pales in comparison with the 1996 elections, where Modakuruchi had 1,033 candidates standing for elections, okay. which is I am sure, a record of many kinds. Now, if you look at the list of names on this, that's what it kind of looks like. So, Parnesami C, Parnesami C, Parnesami C, Parnesami C, Parnesami C, uh, D, K, 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 K. I mean, how do you figure out which Parnesami K you are if you're voting for yourself, right? I mean, <laughs> there's no party symbol. You can't have your photograph affixed on it. So, bizarre. Um, which perhaps led to some confusion because there were as many as 88 candidates who got exactly zero votes, probably because they couldn't find themselves or the election commission couldn't find themselves. Or they just you know, uh, decided to stand for the elections and not vote. We figured out finally why this happened. This was a farmer's protest, and the aim of this committee was to give everybody 500 bucks and get as many as 5,000 people to stand for the elections. Because the office was so crowded, only 1,033 people managed to stand in the elections at that time. But this question of names confusion, it's not very common. In fact, it's not happened until the most recent elections. But in the most recent, recent elections, it has happened, and in, many, in, in a fairly strong way. Uh, you may have heard of the case of the 11 Chandulal Sahus that stood for elections in Mahasamund. Right? So there were 11 candidates with exactly the same name as a sitting MP. Now, this has happened in a number of other places as well in the elections last time. So there were three Lakhanlal Sahus, again, in Chhattisgarh, in, in Bilaspur. Sorry, not three, five. And there were uh, three Jarnal Singhs in Amadmi Party and so on. Uh, and in every case, the party that has been affected is also shown here. And you will find something strange. Despite Congress having contested in the largest number of seats, you'll find that in no place is Congress at a disadvantage. It's always some other party that seems to be suffering from it. I'm not making any conclusions from it. I'm just saying, you know, just, it's just an observation. Now, all of this is just coming out of data. And who would have thought that statistics can actually be as much fun, or perhaps even more, than politics? My one message to you, play around with data. You might find something interesting. <laughs>